Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, having listened in the first part of our meeting um, about the process of accession and how that is uh, slowing and speeding and slowing and speeding, and the effect that it has on the reform drive that is needed. Uh, and I will emphasize that reform drive is not just needed in the countries of the Western Balkan, but in many European countries as well. Um, and I think that my position here would be that a clear perspective is needed uh, for the countries of the Western Balkan with a clear timeline uh, for the process to keep the urgency that is needed. Having said that, my second point is that if reforms are only done for outside reasons, under outside pressure, for ticking boxes that institutions from elsewhere want, that's not going to work. My experience during the Euro crisis when, um, as part of support programs to different Euro countries, we imposed a lot of reforms, that has only in part been successful. And the biggest factor in success or failure of this kind of reform drive was whether the country involved takes ownership of the necessary reforms. If it is felt that we are only reforming because the EU wants us to reform, you will lose public support somewhere along the line. Uh, and um, I think a clear difference in what we did during the Euro crisis, we had five programs, five countries in a program, four of those took ownership. Cyprus was a clear example. They simply said, we need to reform our economy, our institutions, the way our administration works. They were very successful, left the program early, and came out strong. And Greece was an example where, yes, the problems were deep and complicated, but there was very little ownership. And trying to impose it from the outside is impossible, is my experience. So my point is that even independent of the prospect of joining the EU, reforming, modernizing institutions and the economy must continue everywhere. So I was asked to talk about the importance of productivity and competitiveness. And I guess you could say productivity is, um, is easy and it's complex. It's complex because we don't really understand it, certainly not in a digital age. It's much more difficult to understand where are we in terms of productivity when we do so much investment in digital economy. Um, but it's also, I guess, pretty easy. You can improve uh, productivity by working harder or working smarter. That's about it. And working harder is an issue in all of our European countries. In France, there's still a debate about the, uh, the pension age. Should it go up? That's one way of working harder. You simply work for a longer time and keep more people involved in the labor market. In the Netherlands, there's a huge debate about women working part-time. Can we still afford us? Uh, for this large group of women to work part-time. We really need them to work uh, more hours, if not full-time, because we are short of people in education, short of people in healthcare, etc. So it's also an issue in the Netherlands. And I think here in the Western Balkans, it's a big issue to keep young people well-educated here and how to do that. This is all about keeping the labor force uh, uh, optimally involved. Second part is, of course, about how can we work smarter? How can we be more productive in a sense? Which everywhere requires investments. And this is true here in your countries and it's true everywhere in Europe. Our productivity levels are pretty low, uh, improving on average 1%, 1.5% per year, which is simply not enough if you look at the challenges ahead. Uh, and therefore we need to invest much faster in a digital economy uh, in um, uh, sustainability in new production processes throughout our economy. How to do that? And I think we need to look at the policy mix. So one is the sort of the three layers of the policy mix, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and structural reforms. So fiscal policy, we're still in a benign period. I think there is fiscal space. There are funds available in Europe and from Europe. The markets are uh, still interested in providing the funds for it, uh, for public investments. So on the fiscal front, there is room. But the biggest challenge there is, are we spending it on the right kind of things? So here again, I think we need to look very critically 
at what we're spending it on. And education and the quality of education is uh, a huge issue in many European uh, countries. Um, also, we need to realize that this is a, we are now in a good period coming out of the COVID crisis, a growth levels strong in almost all of our countries, but there are also some major risks ahead, and we don't know how long this good period is going to last, so we also need to consider both in the public sector and in the private sector, where are we in terms of buffer capacity? What if the next shock hits us? And this is also for fiscal policy true. Some people believe that building up sovereign debt or debt in general is no longer an issue. Uh, I'm not one of those. I think it will come back to, to haunt us. So let's look at how we can build, also in this good period, some fiscal buffer capacity to deal with future crises. Monetary, of course, is still extremely uh, accommodative, but we need to realize, certainly in the EU, that the ECB does have limits. Though any ECB policymaker will tell you there are no limits, we will do what, is, what it takes. There are limits. There are political limits, there are economic limits to how far they can go, and there are legal limits to how far they can go. And I think we all realize that coming out of this pandemic, therefore we will come to an end of the pandemic program, the accommodative stance will have to be reduced. And also here the ECB needs to stock up instruments to deal with future shocks. So they need to reduce their impact and the size of their um, uh, programs to allow for space uh, for any future shocks to come. So monetary policy, still accommodative, but uh, some risks uh, ahead. And then least attention is always given to structural reforms because they are difficult to do. The effects uh, in economic terms are always slow uh, and they are unpopular. So the chances of winning the election, and I speak from uh, experience, uh, are slim if you have a heavy reform agenda. So here there are also lessons to learn, to think very carefully about how you prioritize, prioritize uh, the reforms, uh, which reforms uh, actually create a spending power for people and which reforms take that away. Get the order right is also, I think, a clear lesson from the many reforms done during the last crisis. And, and I think this is when we talk about investments, and I'm sure the others will talk about investment opportunities in this region, we have to realize the importance of the trustworthiness of governments and the legal system for investments. So I've talked to international investments everywhere and talked to them where they want to invest in Europe and what makes their choice, what determines whether they invest in one country or in the other. And in the end, it boils down to, can I trust the government and the legal system? Is my investment protected? Are my property rights in, uh, protected? Am I protected as a minority holder in an investment? Is there a legal system which I can use, which is effective, doesn't leave me hanging for seven years? but actually give, gives me a clear answer to what my rights uh, and my investment is uh, worth. So all of these aspects are crucial. And this also touches, of course, on the issue that was mentioned this morning, which is about corruption. Having, and I think the Prime Minister of Kosovo made a very strong point here about the stability of institutions. Having strong, independent institutions in all of your country, which outside investors and the business world can depend on is crucial. If you want to increase foreign direct investments, make sure that your institutions are protected. On those institutions should be limited and well organized and, and transparent uh, because otherwise there will be no uh, confidence. So let me stop by saying if you want to be successful in your reform drive, don't sell it by just saying we need to do it because of Europe, but sell it because it improves the standard of living in your country. Do it because it improves the investment climate in your country. Uh, and that, I think, is why we should all do it. <laughs>